Okay, so hello, welcome everyone to our ICBT Friday discussion group. We are a group of clinicians in all different stages of learning ICBT, and this has been a wonderful space for co-learning and contributing to each other and for sharing ICBT with OCD providers worldwide. So thank you for being here and being a part of this. I'm Mary Hosbro, and I'm one of the co-facilitators for these discussions, along with Sylvie Levine and Margaret McCall. And we're currently having panel discussions focused on how to use each of the ICBT modules with clients. And today's panelists are Gina Abundante and Karen Lamb, and they're going to be discussing module three. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat box and we will um, you know, pause and have moments where we can have them answer your questions. And then at the end, we'll have um, likely have some time to open it up for more questions and discussion. And the presentation and discussion will be recorded and posted on the ICBT online website. So please refrain from asking any client specific questions or sharing any um, information where clients could be identified during the discussion. Um, so I'm going to invite our panelists to introduce themselves and then to begin the presentation. Uh, so Gina, are you ready? I am ready. Take the floor. Um, so I am Gina Abendante. I'm an LCSW in New Jersey. I specialize in uh, perinatal anxiety disorders and OCD. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen and find my slides in here. Oh, that was easy. Okay. So how do I share? Here it is. Present her view. Okay. So we are, oh, that's not the first one. We're starting off, starting off strong here. Okay, so we are doing um, module six, which is OCD is 100% irrelevant. So um, I, so with this module, I cannot talk about OCD being irrelevant without talking about module five, which is OCD ima is imaginary. In my opinion, these two modules go together and they're really the lifeblood of ICBT. Um, so without that client being able to buy into or not just buy into it, but really deeply believing the concepts of these two modules, we can't move forward with ICBT. So everything that comes after um, OCD is imaginary and irrelevant is built off of this belief and the client really being able to grasp this and feel it in their bones, so to speak. So these are the two modules that I will stay with with clients for quite a long time. Um, and I will sometimes pendulate with them, meaning we'll stay with these two as the core, and then I'll bring in maybe the tips and or the tricks and the cheats, or I'll bring back in the obsessional story and the um, OCD logic. But I really stick with these two because I think this is um, this is where people have sort of that turning point of being able to use ICBT in a meaningful way. Um, I do find myself coming back to these two modules over and over and over again. Um, so I feel like this is what I really build the treatment with my client around. So before we can move on uh, or move a client on into the OCD is irrelevant, we need to make sure that the client can identify these things. Number one, can they... Um, can they identify imagination versus perception? Are they able to pick out what is their imagination versus what are their, is their perception in their day-to-day -day life? Um, reasonable versus obsessional doubt. Can the client identify reasonable and obsessional doubt in their OCD themes outside of their own as well as their own? So I want them to be able to do both. If they're quicker at uh, recognizing it outside of themselves, but they're getting tricked by their own themes, then we're gonna stay with um, module five for a while. Um, inferential confusion, are they solid in their ability to pick out when they're, they are treating their imagined possibilities as reality? If they can't, I'm not moving on because that really is a pretty core thing that they need to be able to grasp. 
Fusion beliefs. Can a client pick out and label their fusion beliefs in their own themes as well as others? And those fusion beliefs are thought-thought fusion, thought-action fusion, thought-object fusion, thought-event fusion. So again, if they're getting tricked by those things, I'm not going to move on because those fusion beliefs is what ties into the inferential confusion. So we really want them to be solid in that. And finally, with blending, are they aware of when they're mixing concepts and creating an obsessional story? If they can't do that, then I can't move on. You know, they, we need to be able to get them quicker at being able to recognize these, these things and dropping that, um, those obsessional stories. So if they cannot do these five things solidly, then nope, we are not, we're going directly to jail. Do not pass go, do not collect hundred dollars. We have to stay. We cannot start to work on the OCD being 100% irrelevant unless that client is solid in their believing that OCD is imaginary. Otherwise, we will end up trying to convince them or convince our clients, or worse, we start arguing with their content. So if the client isn't ready, don't move on. It's totally fine. There's no, we're not doing the wrong thing and we're not like holding our clients up. We really want them to be able to get these things solidly. This module and the OCD is imaginary module, they, again, they're the integral parts of the ICBT. And if we skip over this or move on, um, we can't skip over it or move on before the client is ready. So for all, with all this being said, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to assume that our clients are, um, they're able to move on. They're ready to move on. They know that their OCD is imaginary. They see it, they know when they're crossing over the bridge. So we're just going to assume that that's happening here. So here we go. What is our job as clinicians in this module? So we are introducing the idea that doubt is irrelevant, even though it is possible. Okay. We are not going to argue the 0.00001% chance that something could happen. ICB states that the lack of sense de data in the here and now makes the obsession arbitrary and irrelevant to the current moment, the moment we're in right now, not what could happen, but right now, which this is the most important part of the module. OCD will always argue that there is a slight chance that if there's a slight chance, it means it's possible and it will laser focus on that possibility. And then clients will notice that their imagination is taking them a on a ride with that possibility. So our job now is to introduce the following concept. Anything OCD is coming up with is irrelevant to the here and now, even if it's possible, because the client is open to the idea that there isn't any sense data to back it up and the story is coming from their imagination. Anything is possible in our imaginations but that doesn't mean that possibility matters in the here and now until there is sense data to back it up. So that is really, that's a long winded way of saying our job is to get clients to recognize in their own way that doubt is irrelevant, even if there's possibility behind it. So just a couple of learning points. Um, so doubt lacks direct evidence. Um, it lacks that direct evidence in the present moment. And because it lacks that direct evidence, OCD is always false. Possibility doesn't matter. Anything is possible because we can imagine it. Possibility cannot be a relevant ingredient to the here and now without evidence from our senses. Doubt is irrelevant in reality. If there is no evidence in the here and now, then it must be coming from our imagination, which makes it irrelevant. And finally, trust in our senses. People rely on and trust their senses in pretty much every other area of their life that doesn't have to do with OCD. So they are not basing their decisions based on possibility. We want clients to develop that trust in their senses again, um, especially in regards to their doubts, just as they're doing in other areas of their life. So what are some tools that you, meaning I, use to highlight this concept to clients? Great question, I would love to tell you. So the first thing I use is called the elephant gun. It's an analogy. I am huge on metaphors and analogies and I also use a lot of memes, that's another story, but today we're gonna use this analogy 
full disclosure, I did not come up with this. I stole it from the OCD stories, but now I am presenting it to you guys. So I use this analogy with clients frequently. So you want to imagine that it's a beautiful day. It's sunny and warm, like one of those really great spring days. And you look out your front door and you see that your neighbor is setting up a lawn chair on their lawn. And their neighbor brings themselves some sunscreen and a jug of lemonade and some snacks and really makes himself comfortable. And last but not least, your neighbor brings out an elephant gun. They sit down and they're just spending hours out there, just hanging out, looking around. And at some point you decide to go out and see what's going on. And you say, hey, Larry, what the heck are you doing? And Larry says, I'm keeping the elephants away. And you say, well, there are no elephants in insert whatever your town is. My town is Southampton. So there are no elephants in Southampton. And he says, exactly. See how well it works. It didn't matter that your neighbor, Larry, doesn't have any sense information or evidence in this exact moment about loose rogue elephants in the town of Southampton. It's still possible. So he kept the gun with him as a safety behavior, a safety behavior based on possibility. So then I will ask clients, how is this story different from your own doubts? Most people will say that it's not different at all. They continue to engage in safety behaviors because, quote unquote, it's possible. They continue to engage in safety behaviors as a just in case, even though there is no evidence to support the need for those um, safety measures in this very moment. So these are some questions that I um, will ask clients. These actually came from Bronwyn. So thanks, Bronwyn. Um, but you can ask either one of these or you can ask both, but it starts to help to get clients to notice that possibility can't back up a doubt without evidence. So the first would be, so when would it make sense to start worrying about dot, dot, dot? When would it make sense to start worrying about elephants in your neighborhood? Well, for me, if I saw something on the news about a loose or an escaped elephant in my town, or if sirens went off and there was an alert that went out, or maybe I saw like an actual elephant footprint in the mud, or if I saw an elephant out in my horse pastures, like hanging out with my horses or something, or if I saw an elephant racing towards me, it would make sense for me to start worrying because I have that sense information to back up that worry, not a, well, it's possible that this could happen, or I heard a story about an escaped elephant once that terrorized a town, or elephants are big animals that are that can be dangerous, or any of the other out of context pieces of logic that OCD like to use against us. So the second question would be, what would have to happen in reality to make the doubt relevant? So what would have to happen? For me, again, it would have to be that an elephant would need to be reported or seen. I would need to see an elephant with my actual eyes, not with my mind's eye. Um, and again, I would need to have that sense information in the here and now to back up that doubt. So again, possibility cannot be a relevant ingredient to the here and now without direct evidence from our senses. So the inevitable question, what happens if a client gets stuck? What happens if they get stuck in possibility or they're like, well, maybe it's possible. So that happens with, with clients sometimes, depending on where they're coming with us or coming in with you know, their level of insight. Some clients have very high insight and they can pick it up really quickly and some don't. Some have lower insight. Maybe they've been struggling for longer or they're still stuck in inferential confusion, but some people need to have a little extra things to help them sort of get unstuck. So what can we do if a client gets stuck? Here's a few things that I will explore with them. First question, what is it that makes your OCD story so different? So here I will have them speak for their OCD. We're looking for sense information in the here and now that they're using to justify their story. Okay. Most of the time folks are using possibility as evidence. And as we already know, possibility doesn't matter. And it's a piece of logic being taken out of context. So we want our clients to be able to start recognizing this themselves 
So we're working on that and trying to build the insight into them using that possibility as evidence again. Uh, what makes the doubt seem so real? This will help us to get some insight into the client as well. What is it that's getting them caught? Are there other aspects that maybe we need to address before the client can accept their doubts irrelevance? Maybe there are some like anxiety sensitivity going on here. So maybe we need to incorporate some interoceptive exposure for them. Uh, we need to flesh this out some. I will also ask them, is this information that makes the doubt seem so real? Is it coming through your retinas or your mind's eye? I stole that from Carl. Um, but again, we want to have them speak for the OCD. On my end, I will write what they're saying. Um, usually it comes out to be another obsessional story. And then we go back and we look for that logic that's being taken out of context. We look for that vulnerable self theme. We look for the imagination role. We're using all of those skills in the previous modules that we've learned that will get us to this point. What would need to happen in this moment to make the worry relevant? We wanna ask this client, what concrete evidence would you need right now to support this doubt? So we wanna flesh that out with them as well. When would it make sense, sense to start worrying? Again, we're looking for sense information, not probability. This is a place where clients can slip up as well. Instead of possibility, they go into probability, like statistical probability. In my case, it is far more probable that I'm going to get kicked or trampled by one of my horses than I'm gonna get trampled by a rogue elephant. Um, and that's just based on probability, right? But again, if I'm focusing on using my sense information, then I can watch for body language cues from one of my horses or you know, being cautious about walking behind them. So that makes the probability irrelevant in that moment because I'm using my senses about the world around me versus like, oh my God, it's probable that I'm gonna get kicked statistically. I haven't been kicked in so long, like all of these things that are being taken out of context. It's still probable that I could be kicked, but statistically speaking, without the sense evidence and the um, sense information and the evidence, that probability doesn't count. It doesn't matter. And then um, address, start addressing with clients how they trust their senses in non-OCD situations. So um, how do people cross the street? How do they know when they're done showering? How do they know when they're full and they're no longer hungry? How do you know when it's time to get a haircut? How do you know when it's time to feed your pets? And all of these other areas of life in which their selectivity of doubt is not present, they're relying on their senses and their real self to make these decisions. So they're not re relying on possibility or probability at all. We want clients to start recognizing and leaning into that, how much they're using their senses in all of those non-OCD situations. Okay. But seriously, help. My client really can't let go of the possibility. What do I do? Okay. There's a couple things that can be happening here. So either the client hasn't quite gotten to believing that the OCD is imaginary, in which case I would go back and dig into that more. What's making you believe it's not imaginary? Not in like an accusatory way, but just trying to help create a greater understanding what what's happening for them in the present moment that makes them believe their OCD is real. Many times it can be physical sensations like you'll hear, but it feels so real. So then I will go back and I'll tell them, okay, show me on the wheel of feelings where this feeling comes up. Spoiler alert, it's usually not there, uh, which means that it's a doubt. So we're going to go all the way back. We're going to discuss the logic and the obsessional story again. Just remember, we're working to disentangle likely years, if not decades of thinking habits. So it's gonna take time. We're gonna have to pause where we are, go back, take a few steps back, come back again. And that is totally a normal process. Another possibility is that either the therapist or the client is going through the modules too quickly. Therapy can become compulsive for clients. And some clients will want to fly through the module so that they get to the recovery on the other side. We need to help them slow down. ICBT is all about helping our clients to understand the process of OCD, and that takes time, okay? 
It's also important for us as clinicians to remember that clients are coming to us again in all stages of OCD. Some have great insight, some don't. We are helping to unwind all of those years of unhealthy thinking habits. And I don't know about you, but the last time that I had to break a habit, it took me way longer than I thought it was going to. And I had a ton of slips. Um, so that's just kind of the way that it goes. Some of us, if we're coming from a pretty strong ERP background, uh, we have that mindset of 12 sessions and you're done, right? 12 sessions and you're out. But we're doing way more nuanced work here. We're untangling and recoding the way that people think. So we kind of have to give ourselves a little leeway in terms of the time that it's going to take to get through these modules um, and really great um, get that understanding. In addition, because we as clinicians, some of us have lived experience and some don't, we will have these moments of, well, I've presented this to you and now you should just get it. That doesn't always happen, okay? Um, at least not in the timeline that we generally have inside of our heads. So it might be that the client isn't, it's not that they're not getting it, it's just that they're not showing it in the way that we expect it to. Let the stuff marinate. This is really intense work that they're doing. Don't expect to go through one module per week. Some clients can, and that's wonderful, but likely that's the exception rather than the rule. So go slow, go back, start over, go through all the modules and then start all over again. A friend of mine runs a comprehensive DBT program and in their skills group, they take six months to cover four core tenants. Okay, six months to cover four modules. And then after the six months is over, they do all the modules again for consolidation. That's a full freaking year for four modules of information. And we're doing 12. So we really want to understand that this is going to take time. We are helping people to unwind a lot of stuff that the brains don't want to let go of, brains don't like to change, and that is okay. So those are kind of my most helpful um, trip, uh, not trips, tricks for working through some of these suck points with clients. And then because I love quotes, I'm going to leave you with a quote. Fear is always about that which does not exist. You cannot fight or you cannot overcome that which, that which does not exist. We just have to give up that effort of excessive imagination and then fighting it. And that is it for me. Awesome, Gina. Thank you so much. Thanks. I did not see any questions come into the, oh, I do see one right now. Um, Carl asks, is it, is it okay if we pause for questions or? Okay. Carl asks, do you ever notice the urge to say, to say to yourself, screw it and shift to tolerance for uncertainty? For example, yes, it's possible. Getting unstuck will require that you tolerate that uncertainty. I mean, yeah, for sure. Sometimes some clients, they they just really get stuck on that possibility, possibility, possibility. And there is always that urge for me to just be like, oh my God, fine. Just like tolerate the uncertainty of the possibility. Okay. If that makes you feel better, like let's, can we just move on? But that's usually a me thing, not a them thing. So I have to like, Keep so then own. that begs the question, Carl didn't ask this, but then how do you work through that um, as you are, as the clinician, kind of that urge to kind of really lean back into ICBT, what you're doing with them? Yeah. I mean, I think for me, it's like, I have to manage my own expectations of what their recovery is going to look like. It's their recovery, you know, like at the end of the day, if they don't want to give up all possibility, it, that's on them. That's their life. You know, I can't like, I can't make that decision for them. I can want that for them, but that's again, a me thing. So I try to like, just lean back, let them have their own experience and their own recovery and their own treatment and, you know, sort of see where it goes. Yeah. 
I really like that question from Carl because I find I sometimes do that like with like, oh, maybe we should jump and do some response prevention here or do some, you know, quick exposure or whatever. But there is a difference between like what you said and noticing the stuck points between like if there's some anxiety sensitivity coming up and some interoceptive exposures needed, then you're that's separate from the obsessional doubt element of the ICBT. And you can clarify that with the client. Yeah, for sure. Because, you know, sometimes if we have depending on what someone has as comorbid stuff with their, um, their OCD. Like for me, I have comorbid panic disorder. So I did have to go through and do a fair amount of interoceptive exposures because of my anxiety sensitivity. So, and for some clients, they need that. So it's not necessarily like an um, intolerance of uncertainty. It's more like their fear of anxiety itself, you know? So I do, you know, sometimes you have to weave some other stuff in there, depending on what the need is, step away from ICBT a little bit, bring some other stuff in. And that's totally, totally normal. Right. We have a couple of people asking about if they, if you are willing to share slides. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. I can I think I can, can I send them to you and then you post them in the group? Cause I don't know how to do that. <laughs> yes, that's fine. Okay. Karen, will you be willing to share your slides too? I'm guessing that question is going to come up for yours. Absolutely. That's no okay. problem. Okay. And then um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Karen, and then I'll try to keep track of if there's questions coming in the chat for the end as well. I appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Karen Lamb. I'm a licensed psychologist in the state of Florida, and I have a private practice, and I treat predominantly OCD and anxiety-related disorders and tics. Tourette's and body focused repetitive behaviors. I am also um, a clinical supervisor for the psychology students at the University of South Florida. And my daughter and I are writers for the organization Not Alone Notes. So if you don't know about Not Alone Notes, it is a group of really dedicated, lovely writers that send personalized notes to people with OCD around the world. And um, my presentation is really similar to Gina's presentation. The way that I learn is I write. And so when I read things, I write things. And so some things you'll see a slide about that I won't talk about because Gina's already covered it. But I hope to take you on a little bit of a tour in module six of doubt is 100% irrelevant. But in order to go there, you got to make some stops. In um, this slide, just acknowledging all the people and all of the resources that kind of provided the evidence and the information that I'm sharing today, because I do think it takes um, a lot of different ways to hear ICBT to help yourselves lay, uh, learn the layers of it. Gina, you used a lovely metaphor about an elephant gun um, in the state of Florida. Sometimes you really don't want to talk about guns. So I use dumpster fires. Um, maybe it it happens to be um, that I see a lot of dumpster fires, but I do use the metaphor and I, I mix my metaphors a lot. So if it, if it doesn't make sense what I'm saying, it's probably because I'm mixing different thoughts. But um, I don't go looking in every dumpster to see if it's on fire. I actually notice where the fires are and then I can do something about it. And I seem to work with a lot of people who are really good at noticing where there are no fires, but there could be. So sometimes we just use the metaphor about dumpster fires. Was there one or did I think there was one or could there be one? I think of module six really as we've boarded the plane, we're all buckled up, we've reached our cruising altitude. And this is the module where we really want to start to highlight, you're already on your way to self-discovery and doubt resolution, but 100% doubt irrelevance doesn't mean you don't have symptoms. It doesn't mean OCD is gone. And I think sometimes people rush to get to this module because they're like, once it's irrelevant, we're good, we're cured, we're, it, it, life is easier. And that's not always the case as Gina really highlighted. And you'll hear us highlight that a lot. 
Um, because it's uh, flip-flop weather here in Florida, but I know it's not flip-flop weather for everybody in other places. You do have to really make sure that people understand the first five modules and their understanding keeps growing each week, right? What I find is what we thought the vulnerable self theme was early, it seems to get more complexities and more flavors. So we go back and in module six, sometimes when we're looking at what's holding the story together, we'll start to look, did we get some things right? What do we need to review? Where are some of the uh, sticky parts or glue that's really holding the ideas that the doubt is relevant? Um, what if, uh, I, I saw the question, what if your client says it feels relevant, they can physically feel a sensation? I love that question because we do talk about inner sensations and then outer perceptions. So I'm going to, we're going to go over an example and um, we'll come back to that. Okay. And I promise we'll give you clarity on that one. Um, this I stole from Gina. In order to get to 100% irrelevant, you must make a pit stop in Re Relevantville. You really do have to see why is this doubt still relevant for this individual in this moment? And I really do like um, thinking about, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll show it to you what I like thinking about and how I like to think about it and why it's important to make this stop in your flight. Because if you don't, you're going to miss something that's really going to be relevant for the client and for your work together. How does the doubt lose credibility? So if, I, if I'm really looking, why is your doubt still credible? Then I can go through some of the techniques in this module of possible versus probable. Gina, Gina described that really lovely, so I don't need to describe that. Selectivity of the doubts, like why here, why now, why are we stuck, what's going on for this? Realizing irrelevance versus relevance. So there we're really looking at like, let's look at your world. Where are we really whittling it down to? And how can we help you understand it? I really like that technique of practicing the neutral obsessional storytelling. And so since we're using um, our flight metaphors today, I love those little cookies that you get on the airlines. They're like little biscuits and they're so tasty. And I just take that and I think about an obsessional story. Tell me how you can make this into an obsessional story. And it seems like everyone can do really bad things just to cookies. For example, what if it fell on the floor? What if it has something gross on it? Once my husband ate a sandwich that fell on the floor of a flight coming back from Sweden, that man got so sick. Like I've never seen a grown man look green and gray at the same time. But he, he did. And so I know that knowledge. And this cookie could have been on the floor, even though it's in the wrapper. And the wrapper might have a little tear in it. If it has a little tear on it, that cookie right there could get me sick. So do I still eat the cookie or do I not? Our clients are already good storytellers. So we just show them how easy it is to tell a story that really makes your stomach turn into knots and feel um, uh, uh, grossed out or anxious or uncomfortable or scared. And we just help them remind them, does the current story have credibility or is it the story and the imagination that's holding the credibility? I do like to ask, does something being possible provide justification for everything and every decision you do in your life? That's a pretty awesome question, isn't it? Um, Sylvie asked, I struggle, oops, hold on, I lost your question, Sylvie. It's okay, I, okay. I, I, you finished, I'm sorry. I okay, no, no, that's all right. 
Um, how's the, how's a doubt still constructed? So what keeps it supported or credible? I really do use Teresa's handout with the iceberg and we look at it. So what do you think is holding it on? What's helping this um, OCD doubt right now? And we look at the reasoning narrative. We really look at the senses. We go into those details. We look at the vulnerable self theme. And I will say, this is usually a place that I see a ton of frustration and sadness. Why am I not getting this? Like what's, what's keeping me? Cognitively, I get it but it's still not penetrating the story completely. I'm not at 100% irrelevancy. And I do love that Fred says, this is the crux of treatment. That's what Gina highlighted. 100% relevant irrelevancy is part of our work, but we're never gonna get there by, um, um, by arguing or, or um, rushing through it. We're gonna get there by really undoing those little strings that are holding all of this together. These are some of the questions. Yes, um, this came from the manual and from Bronwyn and Katie's training and Gina highlighted these questions. I think there it's nice to have a little highlighted sheet of these questions of going through of, you know, what would you really need to have in reality for you right now? And a lot of times I think you will get really good information from your clients. You'll see how they're debating with their content. You'll really see how there are some, um, more than one thing holding them to this last bit of the story. And you'll also see how automatic it is. Like really, this habit has been there for so long. And how, how can I let go of it? Like, what will my life be like? So I like these questions just as your re review of what can I do to help you move towards that this doubt that's constructed can be deconstructed and it can start to become irrelevant. Oh, this is just a fun slide. Come on, let's practice our sense of information with a side of possibility. Gina really did a beautiful job highlighting that for us, we do have to live in a world with possibility and our OCD doubt can still be irrelevant. I think that's so important that both of those things have to be true at the same time, because if you remove all possibility, what you're going to find is that's not a world that any of us can live in. Our goal is to get to irrelevancy 100%. And when the first time I presented this module, I said, I can get you 85% of there. And Fred's like, no, hard no, like not even. I think that's really, really important. We are trying to help our clients in guiding them that um, their doubt is 100% irrelevant. That's a really important factor. You will notice if you ask your clients, is your doubt irrelevant? And they're still holding on to something, you still have more work to do. And I just like this, this quote. Here's our case example. And I think this is an important case example. I gave you guys some hints, but I'm hoping it's gonna be interactive for you. So um, I just kind of have to move the, um, there you go, I had to move the chat box. In this case example, I wanna hear from you guys. I wanna hear what you guys think about um, who this individual is, this is not my case. I am not divulging anyone's personal information. So like no concerns about confidentiality. 34 year old professional with intrusive images. I know sometimes images can really um, confuse people as to what to do with them, but she has had images. They probably started around age 22, 23, but they were never that distressing until she had a child. So she has intrusive images of being in a fatal car accident with her child. 
She utilizes checking, reassurance, seeking, avoidance of driving. When she describes these images, you can just see her fright and her guilt. She feels very upset. Um, she absolutely loved modules one through five. It was like, love this, so resonates with me. It's in my imagination. Great, got it, sense data, check. Really great clients. Um, and she would report to you her OCD symptoms are 85% reduced, like 85%, huge improvement. Her vulnerable self theme is, I'll be an irresponsible mom if I don't check. And one of the consequences she is concerned about, she would have to live with guilt. She did not do enough to protect her child. And a few pieces of relevant information, a family member died unexpectedly. Um, and she has the belief that if that person took care of themselves, they would not have died. She also um, lives at the end of a road. So part of her OCD, she's an image of when she's backing out of her driveway, she will get hit by a car. She lives at a dead end road. So relevant information. And also she, um, um, she only thinks her OCD story happens when she's backing out of her driveway. So she does not think that the OCD story is a wider experience that she has. So part of her information, her accidents happen and she wants to really understand ICBT because if she thinks a certain way, then the OCD OCD story won't be a problem for her anymore. So that's a that's really important to her. She's super conscientious. How do you think you can help her with module six to let go of that last 15% of her OCD story? Anyone have some ideas? I don't mind if you say them or if you type them. Take a walk on the wild side, guys. You're all really smart. You know these answers. I gave you giant yeah. breadcrumbs. Uh, I mean, how, how does she trust herself as a mother in so many other ways? I mean, in terms of trusting herself and being a, a safe mother in so many ways in her life. Absolutely. So um, <laughs> isn't that interesting? It's a bit of selectivity there, isn't it? And like, some people might need the question restated as well as they continue to sure. participate. Sure. How can module six really help her let go of this last 15% of her OCD? Um, she wants it to be irrelevant. She really wants to get to that point where she believes her doubt is irrelevant, but she feels like 15% of something is holding on to her story. And as was just pointed out, there's some selectivity there. So noticing the different places, she would say she does not doubt her motherly skills in anywhere else except for driving. Um, Susan, her reasons for checking is that matches with that image that goes into her mind of the horrific car accident she thinks she's going to have with her child in the car. Is she relying on perception or possibility? What do you think? She lives at a dead end road. Yeah, so Susan, you're saying that that would be a question that could help her, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So perception, and this goes back to the question earlier about sensations. So sensations come from inside and perceptions come from outside of us. And when we're thinking about to trust yourself, trust your eyeballs, trust what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, your common sense. Sometimes those sensations, this woman would clear, you would clearly see her. I feel fear when I have this image and how can I really know that my doubt is 100% irrelevant? How does she usually trust herself in taking care of her child? Well, she's not in the, in the car, she would tell you. 
if I'm not in the car, I really do trust what I do. I trust what I see. I trust when my child is crying. I trust um, that I know what they want to eat. A lot of those different things. And Kate so, and Christina have a couple ideas they dropped in the chat too, I think. And Sylvie has her hand raised. So <laughs> do you want me to read the ideas in the chat? Sure. Um, what's going on with the thinking a certain way and needing to get rid of that 15%, like maybe with that I, has a focus, yeah. Kate, you are brilliant. Absolutely. In her efforts to get through modules one through five and be such a good, responsible human who doesn't want to be irresponsible I need to understand everything just right so I think you're realizing and noticing there's more to this story than just I have the image of, of a horrific car accident and she didn't actually notice that she didn't notice that there's actually more places where the OCD story does touch upon it's not just when she has this image of the horrific car accident and then Christina adds that her vulnerable self theme is still being activated and that that has some, and there's some reasoning that's faulty that's still being used. You got it. So going back to that iceberg that Teresa created, right? There's still a narrative going on, but we didn't know all the places where the narrative is actually active. Her insight is growing in this module. So we wouldn't want to just go super fast. Her vulnerable self is also coming into clarity here. For her, yes, I do want to be a responsible mom, great, but I'm worried I'm going to be irresponsible. And she can see how that's formulated with some past experiences being applied to this current experience. And remember, I, I kind of snuck it in there. This um, image has been in her head now for about like 12 years but it wasn't as active until it actually came true. She had a kid, she's driving this kid now. So this vulnerable self has really had time to weave and um, become strengthened. And then Lynn Lee suggests having her rely more on her senses in non-OCD situations to practice neutral obsessional storytelling as well. Absolutely. That neutral obsessional storytelling is really important. And what in this situation, something that might come up is my awareness was my OCD story, but now I actually realize in other places, I didn't realize my story was still playing. It was a little farther away in awareness. It was still there. And that can bring like a great deal of emotion of like, oh, crud, my story is actually with me much more than I thought it was. I thought it was just in this one lane or one flight. It's now actually on a lot of different flights. I had a I had a thought I would like to share. I, I was wondering if it would be valid in this point to have the client, because the client is coming to the conclusion, that's the inference, that because she has this image then there's a possibility of having an accident that could harm her child and therefore she will be a bad mother and irresponsible. And then I was wondering if it would be valid to ask the client if there is intention because the, she's just putting the image with a consequence, but she is taking herself completely out of the context. We can have images of anything, but it will be the intention, the decision-making of carrying out something with intention that would make us dangerous to our children or, or, or whoever, whatever the theme is. If she can kind of put that in context, per, perhaps would that help decrease that possibility percentage? In this situation, the image, just because the image is there, she really does fuse. So remember Gina talked about the word fuse. She's really fused with image. I feel nervous. Therefore, consequence, danger is lurking. And so to wedge in intention, like, yes, she uh, intention in this situation would probably wind up you're debating the story or the contents. Okay. That would be my take. Yeah. 
But I like that, Sylvia, you want to poke holes in her story. I like that you're you're trying to like, okay, let's see how we can help make this story 100% irrelevant, this doubt. Yes, Carl, that is a very good way to say it, emotional reasoning on steroids. Like what kind of mom would really want to put her kid in risk just by backing out of the driveway? And for this individual, she would very clearly tell you, I know the steps of ICBT. I get it cognitively, but, and you know, um, yes, but no, this is an example of yes, but no, I'm not quite ready to let it go. That's a good point, Mary, um, in response to Sylvie. That's a really good point. Anything else about this lady that you guys think would be helpful to her? Lots of practice of um, neutral obsessional stories. So really important for this lady because she's so rational. So we really do want to kind of move her around and kind of look in, in different places in her life. And because you guys are all on the flight and you're helping people learn about irrelevancy, you're going to go into on your next flight into the bubble, which will obviously be wonderful. Oh, I was muted. Sorry. Thank you very, very much, Dina and Karen, both of you. I was also trying to keep an eye on the chat, so I hope I haven't missed anything, but at this point, there's, you know, eight minutes left. People could feel free to either raise their reaction hand or unmute selves and contribute to questions or discussions as, as well at that point. Is, is that okay with both of you? Okay. Yeah, please feel free to ask whatever questions are still lingering at this point. Lots of thank yous, thank you, thank you. Great presentation coming in and from Fred as well. Sylvie, do you want to say more about what you wrote? Well, I had to disguise the question with another Theme. So I don't know if it flies very well <laughs> because it's relevant to, to someone. But I was thinking, for instance, if somebody's a teacher and it has um, sexual um, themes of pedophilia, um, so it would be relevant. It would be important to figure it out if he is or he or she is not a person who can engage in pedophilic behavior. But I, I don't know. Like, I guess... I can see why the client gets pulled into to go deeper into figuring it out. Well, I guess I would ask, like, where's the relevance to the story? If they are a teacher and they've never had pedophilic behavior in the past, then where's the relevance? Where's the sense information to hold up the obsessional story, you know? In, in this moment, in the here and now, not just I'm having these thoughts and they make me feel really uncomfortable or now I'm having urges, like those can't be, that's not evidence to the here and now. No, no, I, I completely understand that. And that's exactly what I thought as I was making up the question. Like the, if the person never engaged or did anything, mm -hmm. then obviously that will be evidence in the here and now that she or he is not a pedophile. Right. However, I could I can hear an OCD sufferer considering the importance of kind of figuring that out because of the environment they work on or whatever that is. So so that was the question that I have. The differentiating versus um, present in the here and now versus this is something important for me to figure it out because of the possible implications or mm -hmm. where I work or things of that nature. Or mm -hmm. because I'm young and I would 
eventually have children and I could hurt them. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that's what I was just thinking. But I don't, I, I guess that's the piece in which I get really confused myself in relation to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I would probably counter it with, okay, well, let's look at any other possible scary thing. What's, is it necessary for you to figure out if, I don't know, you picked up a horrible disease off of that door handle? No, it's the selectivity of doubt. That's why it's this one particular topic seems so important. And context, I would definitely add context. So in the case example, for 12 years to have the image of a violent car accident, but not give it that much because when I have a kid, it won't actually happen. But now more things have lined up that say, oh, this now must be real. I think that also helps you. Well, now that I work with children, it must be more real. Mm -hmm. And you kind of start to see the how com context, it can really trip you up unless you slow it down. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That's very helpful, both your observations. Like why not are the team is one of the things, why that thing is, is important and other thing wouldn't be, and context, yes. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was a great illustration of how it, it's easy for, to think that something is more relevant when it's not. When yeah. it's not. Anything else that's coming up for anyone? This one, this module is like really tricky. Sometimes even as the clinician, when we yeah. get inferentially confused as well. Mm -hmm. And when a lot of times it feels resolved, moving on through, I liked that both of the presentations brought that up, how important it is to come back to this, like to, to really be a hundred percent irrelevant. It's like the inferential confusion of the client can, can confuse us too. Yes, I've had that happen. I see the question in there. Someone says they're circling back to the physical sensation question. What was the physical sensation question? Oh, here it is. I found it. What if your client says it feels relevant? They can physically feel a sensation. I go back to my thing I say all the time. Well, if you say it feels like, that's not a feeling, that's a thought. So if it's a thought, then we go back to, is it a doubt? Um, feelings are not facts. They are chemical activity that happens in reactions to a lot of different systems in our body. Um, but if someone is saying like something feels relevant and I feel like, then I'll kind of parse that out. Is it a, a thought or is it that you're reacting to whatever that physical sensation is in reaction to a doubt? And to add on to Gina, is that feeling coming from the story mm -hmm. or is it coming from the here and now? I think that's always really important. I can feel anxious, thus the lady in the example. I'm scared right now, but I'm sitting in your office. I'm not actually in the car. That sensation is real for her. Mm -hmm. However, it's in the story. And Fred is responding in the chat as well. I'm making sure I'm catching all this. It's not there and cannot be sense information. It's just not direct evidence. I think, Fred, do you mean it is there? It can be sense information, but not direct evidence? And now muted. Uh, no, it, it, it's not like ICBT doesn't say there is no never sense information. It just, mm -hmm. just says the sense information is not direct evidence. And often in these cases, when there is sense information, uh, it's taken out of context. Or it's sense information that's a direct consequence of the doubt rather than forming any uh, justification for it. You know, because doubts can create exactly the type of sensations that the person fears as a result of the doubt. You know? Yes. So that's important to keep in mind. So when we talk about inferential confusion, we're talking about how information is taken out of context uh, and it's no longer direct evidence because of that. Yes. And that's typical for OCD. It always takes stuff entirely out of context. Uh, 
This makes OCD a little bit different from an anxiety disorder. It's not a matter of ex exaggerating possibilities. It's a matter of it really not being relevant to it. That's why for OCD, you cannot say this thing of it's 100% irrelevant. When we're talking about doubts and many other type of conditions. But with OCD, you can say that because it is constructed in this way in the imagination. And if it's not, then it's probably or it may not be an obsessional doubt disorder. And then Carl dropped the teaser that we will address this more next week. So <laughs> I guess that is a good wrap up point. Thank you so much, um, Gina and Karen, for the great presentation and discussion. And thank you everyone for contributing to the discussion and asking questions. Next week, we'll be uh, talking about module seven, the OCD bubble. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.